Welcome to our first session for the Lent book study. We are studying the book Practicing Our Faith by Dorothy Bass. Faith takes practice, and if we are to follow Jesus, we have to practice what he taught. So this week we begin with a study on chapter 12, which is titled Dying Well. We are excited to be joined tonight with, by two guest experts. We've got Chad Penley, who is the manager and funeral director at May's Ward Dobbins Funeral Home just across the street from the church, and Chris Morkish, who is the chaplain at Presbyterian Village in Austell, and several of our church members currently live there. So we have a relationship with both of these folks, and we're just really excited that you guys are here. We really are excited. We, it, you know, uh, Chris and Chad, I admire you both a lot already, and I am really grateful that uh, together we serve this community. Mm. Uh, I'm honored that you're with us here tonight, and I want to... Um, Thank you for being willing to share your wisdom and experience with us. Last Wednesday, just a week ago, we celebrated Ash Wednesday, and this is one of the more somber moments in the church year. Ash Wednesday is a time of reflection, repentance, and during the Ash Wednesday service, we remember the, the ashes on our foreheads, and we recall our mortality with the words, remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Mm -hmm. This week, we continue that conversation as we turn to this chapter on dying well. Uh, Cassie, as you read this chapter, what were a couple of key points or themes that really stuck out to you? Well, I, I really liked the way she began uh, by reminding us, uh, these are actually words in uh, one of our Presbyterian uh, confessions uh, in the brief statement of faith. She, she really reminds us that in life and death, we belong to God. And uh, it, in other words, we, we, we aren't, our, our, our life is not all that there is. Death is also included in that. And so nothing can separate us from God's presence or God's love. And death is not the final word. So I love that she began with that, really with that claim and that, that carried throughout the chapter. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing that stu stuck, out, stuck out to me uh, is, is just that we, death does not separate us from God. And so not only that, it also doesn't separate us from our faith community. So even, even into eternal life, we are present with our faith, yeah, the, the, the community of believers after death. So uh, this made me, made me think of when you drive around, um, even in Marietta, you'll see old, older churches will have a churchyard, like a graveyard attached to the church. And it's there because there is this belief that, that when we gather on Sunday, we gather with, with all that all the saints are gathered. And so I, I love that that was really a focus of, of the communal part of, of how we handle death is, is a communal thing. And that, that was the, I guess the third thing I noticed is that dying well is a communal activity. She called it a shared practice. I think that was on page 165. Um, and not only is the way that death is handled communal, it's the, the grieving process is also communal. So one way that we practice dying well is that we hold one another up in prayer. Uh, we voice what the person who's grieving or dying may not be able to voice. She gave this wonderful story uh, around a, a grandmother on her deathbed and how the people around her were praying on her behalf or pray, you know, saying the words that she herself could not say. Um, almost like the way that you're prayed for at your baptism. People around you are making those claims on your behalf because you're not able to. And I thought that was really... It was really, really touching. Mm. Oh, Cassie, this is the part where I'm supposed to add to your summary, but I don't really have anything to add. That was a perfect summary. <clears throat> <laughs> Thank you for that. And, and I, I, I agree so much. You know, we sometimes we think of um, death as like uh, solitary or um, something that you have to do by yourself, but that's not necessarily true. Uh, like all the other... Um, life cycle moments, even at death, um, uh, ideally we're surrounded by our family and our family of faith. Um, th this chapter offered a lot of um, appreciation for those traditions or rhythms that help us move from, from death to the funeral and then through the mourning process. Uh, every community I've served in as a pastor has had slightly different traditions when it comes to um, uh, uh, the funeral and mourning and dying. Uh, it, the first funeral I officiated when 
I served at the church in Columbia, Tennessee, the casket was pulled by a mule drawn carriage out to the cemetery. Columbia, Tennessee is the mule capital of the world. And so the first funeral that I officiated there, that a mule drawn um, uh, hearse. But regardless of the regional rhythms or traditions, all our traditions surrounding death and mourning have been disrupted during this pandemic. Uh, we just haven't been able to do things the way that we once did. Um, Chad, Chris, how has the mourning process changed over the last year? Um, funerals, um, Chad, maybe we could start with you. How have funerals changed? So they've changed quite a bit, you know, obviously, and the chapter really talks about the community, right? Um, you know, and it's a communal experience is how people can gather and, you know, and kind of help uplift that person and, you know, carry that person through that that's obviously has changed, right? Um, we, it's hard to gather, um, to get people together through all this. It's, it's hard to get into the church to even have, you know, that kind of experience. So, um, this past year has been tough for a lot of people, um, just because they're just not surrounded by everybody, you know? Um, so there's been some bad, but there's been some good, you know, and the good is that it's become more intimate. It's become the family center has become stronger. You know, families have really leaned on each other. Um, so we've seen some, some sweet moments come out of it, but there's been some hard moments too. Uh, but it also there is also the fact that that uh, people are having to put some of the real uh, work of grief aside. Um, so often I, I have a, um, a grief support group. Well, we haven't been able to do that grief support group uh, in person. Uh, Stephen Ministers, we have a Stephen Ministry out at the village. Stephen ministers uh, are feeling like uh, it's so difficult to just speak on the phone. They want to be able to sit across from. They want to be able to hold a hand. Uh, and all of that kind of diminishes the process of grief. Mm. So. Chris, I love that. I love the way you're talking about this. This has really been a moment, um, a time when uh, where we're kind of reclaiming the priesthood of all believers. Yes. Uh, we have um, the, our, our church members at home are setting their own communion table uh, there. We, we even had, uh, we, we invited the congregation to, to burn their own ashes and to mark their own foreheads with the ash, with the ash on ash Wednesday to, and, and I suppose that's really the main focus of this book study practicing our faith, Cassie and I wanted to equip the congregation in, in saying, you know, we're not church members anymore. We're all disciples and let's, let's practice it. Let's, um, let's get going with it because the, the truth is um, something I've experienced more than once is the one who brings the most comfort to the mourning family is not necessarily the clergy but it might be the um, organist, it, uh, uh, it, it could be the custodian, it could be anybody when it comes to bringing comfort to those who are in uh, the pain after experiencing death, Christ equips us all. Right. Yeah. Uh, but I, I wanna just say um, one thing that I, I appreciate, uh, is the interaction that I have had with different members of the funeral homes uh, who have come in at this moment that we're in uh, and their compassion, support, uh, giving families um, a time that, because so many of our families have not been able to come into the, uh, uh, at least, at Presbyterian Village, they haven't been able to come into Presbyterian Village to have regular visits uh, or in the hospitals. Um, and I have, I have personally experienced how funeral homes have gone and they have um, made sure that a person who has, has died 
has been um, respected. They have gone ahead, they bathed the person, they have prepared the body so that the family members have been able to come in and say goodbye. They weren't able to do that because of the closed hospitals and closed um, healthcare facility or you know the, the continual care facilities. And, and so I've seen where, um, you know, I think we, we hear, especially uh, with the Jewish population and the uh, Muslim population of, of preparing a body for burial. And um, you know, Christian church, we've kind of gotten away from taking on that responsibility ourselves as family. Uh, but I have observed how um, the funeral homes have prepared and then allow families to come in and spend that time so that they can be tangibly with the person for whom they love mm. uh, and to say goodbye. And uh, I mean, and I really, uh, I can't say how much I appreciate that role that the funeral homes have taken. Uh, and they're never in a rush. I mean, they, they have made it perfectly clear. We are not, you, you spend as much time as you need. Uh, and uh, that has happened time and time again. Uh, so for that, I, you know, Chad, I, I can't help but say uh, what an incredible role uh, the funeral homes and the directors and staff are providing uh, to at least help to, to uh, support the families in the grieving process. Because part of it is being able to see the tangible mm -hmm. and to have one last touch, one last kiss on the forehead. Um, we need that. As humans, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. That's a thanks, Paul. That's a good kind of segue into a, another thing we were wondering about, and um, been thinking about death. Well, I actually had a I had a dream last night that I was at the, one of the first funerals that I that I ever attended as an adult. I was in college, and my roommate died in a skiing accident, and I just remember that you know at that point it's like okay, mom and dad aren't going to take care of this. So the question was, okay, what do we do? Someone that we care about has died. And beyond just dealing with that grief myself, it was like, number one, we get flowers. Number two, we buy a card. Number three, we ask the family if there's anything they need. Number four, we go to the funeral and we're present there. Number five, we check in on her sister because she was still in school with us. So today we can't do that checklist or parts of it don't make sense. Um, I mean, do you get flowers when there won't be anyone to see them? It's just, it's a strange time. So how have you seen people comforted during this time or what, what someone we know has passed, what are some steps that people have, you know, maybe creative ways to ritualize that um, and show that support? Yeah, so absolutely. And like I said, and, and for a lot of families, um, you know, when you kind of take a take away the, the pomp and circumstance of the funeral, you know, all the plan, all the stuff that you have to do, that's when you can really focus as a family, you know, on that person and that's that's when the service gets very intimate um mm -hmm. you know because maybe you're not going to stand up and say any words about your dad because all the people that are behind you in the church you know and it you're uncomfortable with it but i see more people sharing you know their their feelings sharing stories you know there's more you know laughing you know that it's just more intimate so that's the special part of it um but, you know, the, the way that we're adapting people, you know, that they're sending, you know, they're still sending flowers, they're sending cards, you know, there's a lot of, you know, just messages virtually, social media, you know, all that, any way that they can, you know, find a way to contact that family, you know, to, to still show that support um, on, like on our website, there's a tribute wall where everybody can go and they leave messages and all that. And families eat that up they just love that they go back and they read those it's it's a, it's an online register book you don't you can't come to the funeral home and sign the register book but you can do it online right and so families take a lot of comfort in that um the you know the biggest thing is nobody wants to be forgotten you know nobody wants to think that they're alone you and the book speaks about that and it speaks about that very well i think 
Um, so showing that support any way you can, you know, I, it, it's, it's amazing and it does a lot for the families for sure. Chad, I hadn't thought about that before. You, you know, the, uh, for, for so many families who the day of the funeral is kind of a blur, I've heard it described yeah. that way. You, you, you might, you might hear from, um, 300 people or, you know, 50 people in the visitation line and you don't remember what every, what everyone says. But if it's there on the online um, re registry, you can read it again and again and again. That's uh, right. Gosh, that's amazing. That's wonderful. Well, and I can't help but think, you know, with the Tatnell family, they actually, yeah. uh, when, when Gil Ward passed away, yeah. uh, it was a resident at, at the village and somebody who actually my, my cousin up in Philly knew because he had been the executive, um, executive presbyter there and Dean had worked with him. Um, and it shows how small a world we are. Maybe it says something about Presbyterians. Yeah. But, um, but what I appreciated was that uh, they arranged and orchestrated uh, to have a group help to, to host the, the Zoom uh, service that mm -hmm. was conducted. And, um, and but it, so it was recorded, but it also gave, gave family members an opportunity to, to speak mm. and to offer, um, mm. offer their support, but it was live. And, and, you know, there were, it was this wonderful moment where I said, okay, I'm now going to step aside mm -hmm. and let you all just catch up with one another. Yeah. And the family just continued to be on zoom and, and there was this great kind of joy, uh, but support. Uh, I've also seen where family members who might not want to play a piece of a, a piece from a, a favorite piano uh, concerto, they wouldn't want to play that maybe in the church yeah. or in our chapel, but they've recorded that and sent in that video as their offering. Uh, others have, have uh, written poetry, which maybe, and, and especially as we've had a little bit longer to produce, because it really is a production when you're putting together uh, something like a, a Zoom memorial service, they've had a little bit more time to work and to reflect uh, and to create. And so I've seen where families have have turned to poetry, music, uh, where they've thought about, uh, yeah. truly thought about uh, some of the different themes that they want to celebrate, which when you are trying to get a service in within a week, that just doesn't always happen. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Y'all, th those are great thoughts about the, about the funeral. Um, you know, uh, Nancy Tatnell's writing us again, Chris. She, it, 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 if you feel loved by Nancy Tatnell, it's justified. You, you deserve it. Uh, she, she just typed in Chaplain Morkish and Reverend Joe Bryce officiated in the Gill Ward Memorial Service. Their leadership and presence was invaluable. And I remember, if I remember correctly, Joe Bryce officiated that funeral, but you were sitting there with Joan. In the Presbyterian Village, because uh, Andy and Nancy couldn't couldn't come in, really be there. I, I think about the physical presence so much. Um, in that instance, uh, it, I would have it would have made me feel so much better to know that you were sitting with my mourning mother, mother-in-law, um, right. uh, because you just a physical presence brings so much healing. I think about the hallways of our church as a uh, sacred space in the sense that on the way to the service, on the way to Sunday school, you might pass so-and-so and have the chance to grab their hand and say, I heard you lost your nephew and I want you to know I'm so sorry. Mm -hmm. um, those moments um, are hard to come by. Those moments of physical presence. Uh, what do y'all suggest we do as we, how do we care for the members of our church who have lost a loved one during this pandemic? When we don't see them on Sunday, we can't hold their hand. What, how do we reach out 
and offer comfort. Well, one thing I shared when we were meeting earlier this week uh, to talk about our time together, and that is that uh, I think a few things that one could do is uh, so often letters will come rather quickly within the first week or two, and then they start to, to stream off and decline. Uh, and to be aware of that, and I try to make it a practice of, of writing letters months after, because I know that they've been, families have been bombarded, and it's to remind them that we haven't forgotten. Uh, I also shared that, uh, have a, a resident, her name is Sally Harden, and Sally, literally, she writes in her calendar the date that the person has died, and then she writes a card a year later, and a year later, she hands me a card and says, put the address of this person on it, and I send it off. And, but she's made a point of every person a year after the, the death, she sends a card and reminds them, I've been thinking about you. I've been praying for your family. That's another way of, of supporting uh, that's not in the immediate, not in that moment, but spreading out. Because the mourning process, it, it, it's not you don't move through it in two weeks. No. no. If, if ever. And I, you know, and some folks will say, oh, oh we need closure. And, and I have been one who finds that I don't, I don't believe in closure. I believe that the pain may not be as, as um, um, strong. Yeah. But, but I personally don't want complete whatever closure is supposed to represent because um, I do remember, I mean, my family will gather and will remember a grandparent that died back in 1974. Mm -hmm. And the way in which the stories come forth, it's as if that person is right there at the end of the dining room table with us. And yeah. maybe that where, you know, as Cassie had mentioned, you know, um, that's, that's about the, that's talking about the cloud of, of saints, uh, the witnesses that we, we are surrounded by, both the living and the dead. Uh, and, uh, and, and I think that's a healthy way for us to, you know, to share those stories. Uh, I'll often yeah. remind folks that there might be a great grandchild sitting in the uh, congregation or, or sitting among us or being on the Zoom and and it's our responsibilities to tell the story, to share our memories. Um, and so it is ongoing. And, and not to shy away from and say, oh, I don't want to start any tears. And I don't know what to do with the, those wells when they open. Well, yeah, that's being human. <clears throat> Amen. And we got another uh, comment in the chat here. Uh, another nice idea is to send a card to family on the deceased person's birthday. I really like that idea because there, there are milestones throughout the year where just it, that are especially tender and where anniversaries. Yeah. Anniversaries. Anniversaries. Yeah. Huh. Y'all, I, I, um, I have a personal question. Um, I'm one who suffered a loss during this pandemic. Uh, several months ago, my, my grandfather died and my mom just couldn't get her head around uh, how we would be able to have a funeral. And a lot of people, I, I think a lot of people are kind of like that. And I understand their hesitation. Uh, but now without a funeral, I haven't been able to say goodbye to my grandfather the way I thought I would be able to. Uh, when I first became a pastor, my grandfather used to talk about how I, how he wanted me to speak at his funeral, uh, which made me sad thinking about it. But um, now that he has died, I have things that I've kind of been wanting, waiting to say that I would like, like to say. And um, for those of us who haven't been able to have a funeral at all, or the funeral that we thought we'd have, um, who haven't been able to say goodbye, what should we do? And um, what can we do? Chad, you want to start? Yeah. So it's not, not an easy question, right? So it's different <laughs> for everybody. Um, but, you know, 
again, the, the main principle of the funeral is to honor that person, right? You're honoring their memory and you're doing that through stories. You're, you know, different things that, you know, that's what we do at every funeral. We share stories and, you know, and we're just honoring that memory. So something I encourage families to do is, you know, don't stop talking about that person, you know, um, and like in your case with your grandfather, you know, even calling your mother, right? When something, when something reminds you of something, whether it's a, you see something on TV, right? That you knew, you know, would have been funny to him, or maybe you ate something that was like his favorite meal, you know, call somebody and, and tell them about that, you know, keep their memory alive by sharing mm -hmm. stories, um, you know, honoring that person, uh, and it helps you, you know, because you're getting to tell that and you're getting to, you know, kind of walk through that, you know, that grief is different for everybody. But, um, you know, that's the biggest thing that, you know, I tell people to do is, you know, and, and a lot of people, when they call people that they don't want to talk about it, they think, you know, yeah. that we don't want to bring it up, you know, or any, and that's the worst thing. So many people. It, it just tears them up when, when you dodge, you know, talking about their loved one, you know, they want to talk about their loved one, and especially if they didn't have that opportunity to have a service or something. So just that conversation, you know, back and forth, you know, it does a lot. It does a lot of good for you and the person you're that. to, for sure. It's okay to talk about it. Absolutely. And, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm getting, we're, we're getting the Jean Tafoya a very wise and thoughtful person. Um, she, she just, she wrote in a question that I kind of have too. Um, yeah. For those who, who have, who've lost someone in 2020 uh, and, and, you know, we, we, we said, put the funeral off or, or uh, wait until next year. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm even thinking about those funerals that we had, but they were sort of miniaturized versions of what we would have had. Right. Do y'all have ideas? And, and this isn't the first time this has come up. I've heard I've heard this question asked several times. As a church, what can we do? I, and and I think about the All Saints service a little bit this way. Like, what <clears throat> what could we do once this is all over? Yeah. What could we offer those families who postponed the funeral? Uh, yeah. Is is yeah. there is there a way that we can reclaim some of what we? postponed or lost or missed yeah, out I, I think so and and i think it's it's a great thing to do it's a double-edged sword though so um, many of the families that we have served have put off that service yeah. the bad part of doing that is that just like you're talking about with grief right Gr grief is this roller coaster it's something it never goes away the pain of a loss never goes away you just learn how to deal with it better every day right yeah. So months that has gone by, we've had many, many families that call us and say, you know what, you know, we're, we're good. You know, we've had this time, we got together as a family, we had a big meal, you know, no need for the service. Um, a lot of families have told us that, but on the other end, that finalization is not there. You know what I mean? And yes. they don't want to have that service because they're scared they have to relive it. You know, they're finally getting into a better place and now we're going to have a service and it just throws them right back in, you know, into the deep of it. And, um, a lot of families are just scared to face that. Um, so it's different for every family. I think there's a lot of families that would enjoy and that are planning to have some sort of, you know, community involvement, you know, some sort of service somewhere. Uh, we encourage every family to, to do something right it doesn't have to be big we don't have to come to first pres and you know get everybody involved and you know have a big service as much as we would like to but you know like i said having a family dinner you know and sharing stories creating a memorial service of some sort somewhere right is a whole lot better than just putting it off and say we'll get to it because mm -hmm. it, it hurts a lot of people when they do that because it doesn't eat Go ahead, Chris. No, no. I, well, I was just going to say that that uh, you know, the uniqueness of being at Presbyterian Village is that mm -hmm. uh, uh, when I was serving at First Presbyterian Church of Atlanta, we might have 26 deaths during the year, or at the most, I remember, and I was there uh, for 10 years as the associate pastor for care ministry. And 
And uh, at the most, we had about 37. Well, at Presbyterian Village, I, I run an average of about 64 deaths during the year. Right. And, um, and we really have put my last um, in-person funeral service uh, was uh, in the middle was in the middle of February a year ago, and I I do think that I know that the residents are wanting to celebrate and remember, and would like to see actually one large service. We do an All Saints Day service yep. uh, at the first Sunday of November, and uh, and we remember and we light candles, but there's a desire to go a little bit deeper in how we will celebrate. And we've talked about accumulating different stories about each of the um, residents and have family members contribute. And it would be kind of a large, large service. Yeah. Uh, but what we are, we're, I had somebody said to me, not only did COVID-19 um, take uh, an opportunity for me to be with my mother. COVID-19 stole the opportunity for me to hold her hand when she was dying. COVID-19 has um, stole the opportunity for me to um, have the type of homecoming that she so rightly deserved. Yes. And COVID-19 is, is stealing my opportunity of grieving healthily. Yeah. And it's like, Yes, and then that's compounded mm -hmm. by it's, it's not just one person who, who feels that way, but the wider community and that transcends First Presbyterian Church of Marietta, but goes into the Roman Catholic Church there in Marietta and the Methodist Church and the Baptist Church. And I mean, we as a community, and I, I wonder, I think um, to myself in whether whether we have a relative that died of COVID or not, yeah. you know, when there was a remembering nationally, um, when, and, and this is, you know, not political, this is just, we as a nation needed an opportunity to grieve. Yeah. And, and I could, similar to yourself, I had a cousin that died a year ago. We, have had to delay his service, but I could think of Don as I was hearing, even though Don didn't die of COVID, I, I was robbed the opportunity to have that service until we keep kicking that can down the, the road. Um, and, and I can't help but think, you know, finally there was a sense that, that we had other people recognizing this need. Um, it's interesting. I, the uh, the National Cathedral in D.C. Um, has put everybody's name up on the wall and has lit lit candles. So when we passed five hundred thousand deaths, they actually lit a candle for all of the and it it just and it's all along this. These, these ornate walls in the cathedral. And I thought, yes, that, that was an outward pouring. And we do need to find that outward pouring. And uh, even though there wasn't a single person that they, as they pan, mm -hmm. you, you don't see any human beings. They're wow. just the just name. Candles. And it candles and, and the names of those who, the 500,000 that have died. And, um, and yet I want, I want the flesh. I want the tangible. I want the person. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I, I had this great professor who um, his son was upstairs and said, Daddy, I'm afraid of the dark. And and Carson said, you know, don't worry. You, you know, God is with you. And he, he said, yes, Daddy. And then he called down again. He's like, Daddy, can you come up? I, I you know, I'm afraid of the dark. And he said, Car uh, Carson called up again and said, it's okay, you know, God is with you. And he said, yeah, I know God is with me, but I want somebody with skin on. And I think to myself, that's out of the mouth of babes. Come on. And it's like, you know, 
That's right. We need somebody with skin on. And as powerful as, as it is to see those names and to see the candles lit, yeah, I, I hunger for that time when, you know, when we're not having to say, okay, I'm wearing an N95 and I got the face shield on. Can I give you a hug? Right, right. And, right. and I've done that. And I've said, you know, and somebody has said to me after their husband died, they're like, I needed that. Yeah. I've needed that, you know? Um, and so you kind of break protocol because what? We're human. Yeah. And that's what we hunger for. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's, we maybe part of this, we have to sometimes break the rules, but also be careful and be smart about it. Because we need somebody with some skin. Because we need somebody with skin on. I love that, Chris. Y'all, this has been absolutely wonderful. And uh, we're, we're, we're getting more comments. Beth, I appreciate so much this idea. I'm going to write a letter about my grandfather and send, give it to my mama. I will do that. <laughs> uh, Cassie, this has been wonderful for me. What, what, ta what takeaways uh, are you getting from this conversation? The big one it was really that, that idea of we need people with skin on. Um, just the idea that, that any, anyone may be the person that is the hands and feet of Christ in that moment to, the, yeah. to a person who's hurting or who's grieving. Um, Sue Velarde had also written a comment that, uh, that her sister got to talk to the nurse that was the last person their mom talked to before she passed. And just mm -hmm. knowing that like, what a gift it is to, to know that this per was the person that was with my loved one, that my loved one wasn't alone. Um, yeah. So that I, I'm taking that away, that, that we all have this opportunity and um, you know, be empowered to, to take it. And I, I think the second thing is that it's never too late to tell the story of the person who's been lost. And it's never too late to call and say, hey, I was thinking about you. I just wanna know how you're doing. Um, I mean, it can be as simple as that making yourself available to, to, you know, I think most of us have probably known someone in the last two years or have lost someone ourselves in the last two years. Um, and just knowing that there, you can always reach back out and it's, that it's not too late to do that. And keeping that story alive is important to the families. So um, that's, a, that's a big encouragement. I feel like there's a lot of very tactical things we've talked about that, that folks can do. Um, and maybe the third is know that we're in a national place of grief and there's a lot everyone is walking around with that baggage mm -hmm. um so let's not pretend it's not there you know mm -hmm. it's okay to to acknowledge that and um and just know that we're all working through that i love that but do you want me to, to you want to wrap up now joe you wrap it up cassie all right ready? Well, i can wrap it up okay go okay all right all right everyone I want to thank you for being with us tonight. Thanks especially to my friends, Chad and Chris, who I now feel like I know even better <laughs> and love and respect even more than before. And finally, may the God of hope be with you all. Go in Christ's peace. Good night. Good night. Thank you.